and we want to welcome all of you to the second of our virtual alumni seven speakers. Um, our seven talks, as you know, are on Wednesdays uh, and for the next few Wednesdays. Uh, and we'll be sending out a reminder uh, every morning, um, every Wednesday morning to let you know so you can um, be sure to join in uh, on the day. Um, we really want to thank Tom Trevini for his willingness to be here with us tonight and, and give us his seven talk. Um, Tom was actually scheduled to be one of the seven speakers at the alumni symposium in San Francisco that was postponed uh, when the COVID uh, outbreak first started. Uh, and when we rescheduled, it's for October and Tom couldn't make those dates. And so we came back to him and asked him if he would be willing to share his talk uh, with all of us uh, virtually. Uh, and he was more than willing to do that. So we're really, really thrilled uh, that he is, is willing to, to do that, to spend the time with us. And Tom, um, I'm happy to give you the floor so you can tell us your story. Thank you so much, Megan, and um, thanks, thanks to the foundation for, for giving me this opportunity. I, it is so nice to be able to, to join you all and to connect with other people in the Moorhead Cane community. Um, you know, it's really, really comforting and, and more important now than ever. Um, so to just give you a little bit of an overview about uh, what I'm going to dive into, um, I'm Tom Trevini, class of 2010, and I'm a writer for The Late Late Show with James Corden, formerly uh, Today we're going to talk about self-doubt. Um, and the reason I want to talk about that topic is, and why I think it would be relevant even to a group of very highly successful people generally, is that, you know, one of the things that stands out to me when I think about Moorhead Kane scholars and alumni is, you know, that they're really emotionally intelligent people, that they are really able to empathize and connect with people and work on teams and manage and, and think creatively in groups. And it's such an important strength, especially in terms of I think leadership for the future, but that sensitivity that we have that allows us to, to connect really fundamentally and emotionally with people, there's, there is a flip side to that. And you know, that sensitivity that allows us to be so compassionate and so generous when we're working with others, sometimes it can be kind of a problem when we're trying to understand ourselves. You know, we can be compassionate and generous with others, but when it comes to ourselves, sometimes we are more judgmental, we are more critical. And I think it's something that a lot of successful people struggle with and you know, don't always feel comfortable talking about. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my very weird career path and, and sort of how I worked, you know, how to face self-doubt and work through it along these different stages. Um, so thank you for, for allowing me to connect with you on that. I mean, first of all, I was raised in a very, very risk averse household. Both of my parents grew up in India with very little and they risked a lot to come to the US when they were in their twenties with not a lot of plans. They didn't really know anybody. They didn't have any money. And so I think growing up, they were kind of like, okay, we've taken enough risk for generations to come. So you guys just relax, like take it easy, you know, and they were always, you know, really encouraging of education and high achievement, but it was always like, we want you guys to be ambitious, but not too ambitious. Don't do anything crazy. Don't go try and change the world or anything. So there was always this idea of like, if you don't choose some path that guarantees stability and guarantees prestige and guarantees a high income and all that stuff, you risk losing out on that stuff. And it's, it was like this idea kind of weighing on me that if I risked not having that kind of success and then I failed, all this hard work I've done will have been lost. My parents suffering coming to this country at all would have been for nothing. So not to brag, but my self-doubt started from a very early age. Um, and that was something that even, of course, you know, being awarded a Moorhead Kane scholarship was the opportunity of a lifetime. I could not have been happier, but there was, you know, there's still part of me that struggled to, even as a scholar, because while it was so exciting and it felt like being on campus was just this, the opportunities were limitless, you know, there's still that very human nature that, you know, I struggled with then. And I think everybody struggles with, you, you tend to compare yourself to others. And, you know, it was so exciting. And I thought, you know, look at me, I'm on campus, I'm learning, I'm exploring. But then I'd see someone who has got their undergraduate research published or who is in the running for the Rhodes Scholarship. And I think, uh, you know what? I think I fooled them. I don't think I really belong here. A little bit of that imposter syndrome kind of sneaks in, you know? And to be honest with you, like when I was in high school, I grew up in a small town. I went to a small school and, you know, for a lot of life, things kind of came easy to me in school. And I kind of was able to not only rely on natural abilities, but I came to sort of believe that if I wasn't doing something naturally and easily, 
It meant that I wasn't good at it. And so that really hurt me because I think sometimes when I felt really challenged or I felt like I was really struggling with something, which is how you learn and how you grow. Being challenged is, is so important. I instead started to think, you know what, this is really hard for me. I'm, pr I'm probably not as smart as the other people on campus, you know, or I didn't do great on that task. You know what? There's no way I could ever learn this stuff. This is the wrong subject for me. Or I worked with a group. I really, I got a help. I got a lot of help from a friend. You know what? Like that must mean that I'm not a leader if I rely on somebody else to get help. And so those were thoughts that, you know, made it hard for me at times to figure out what I wanted to do. I was somebody and still I'm somebody who has a ton of different interests. I may not be particularly excellent at any of them, but breath wise, I have a ton of different things that I love to explore and learn about. And sometimes when I saw someone who had a laser focused career path, I thought, okay, they've got it all figured out. So their path must be really important. They must be really good at what they're doing because I'm not sure if I want to be a doctor or a comedy writer, so that can't be good. Um, so I wrestled with a lot of, you know, especially during, you know, what some people have experienced. I learned this term in college, sophomore slump. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I was pre-med, I was an economics major. And when it came to, I had this really important summer because when it came to choosing what I wanted to do, I looked at where some of the alumni worked and I saw that there was an alum, Jonathan Benson, who was a field producer at The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. And that just like leapt off the page at me. You know, like there's, there are these times where you're not sure, you don't know what you're doing. Then there's sometimes where something just leaps at you and you're like, okay, that is the dream. That is what I'd love to do. And so I know, like I told you about, um, you know, kind of this mindset that I had growing up, I would have never taken the risk to try and do an unpaid internship in New York City on my favorite show alone. But the foundation gave me this opportunity to say, this is a dream for you, go for it. We're gonna help you do it. So I went and had this amazing summer. It was so much fun. It was so cool to be in that room with all these people who were so brilliant and so funny and so talented. And at the end of it, I thought, okay, so now what? I talked to somebody about, okay, well, what if I, what if I wanna become a comedy writer? What do I do, you know? And people said, well, right. Okay, that makes sense. What about like, if I wanted to like, really just pursue a career, get a job and work my way up. Someone was like, well, you'd be a production assistant and make 20 grand a year. And then, you know, you work for five or 10 years, maybe you'll work your way up to producer. And it was like, that old mindset crept back in. And I was like, oh, no, that, that's not me. I couldn't do that. You know, what if I work for five, 10 years, and I never get anywhere? You know, I'm just like the guy who's still sweeping the floors at 45. And so then I did the next best thing. I became an investment banker. Very logical train of thought. But the thing was, I was an economics major. I wanted to just get a job. And I thought, you know what? Maybe that was a fun thing to explore while I was young. But maybe the fun's over. And I just got to get a real job. I got to follow a path. And for a while, it was really comforting to have a path that was set out for me. I knew that, OK, if I do two years of investment banking, two years of private equity, I'll be a shoe into Harvard Business School. I'll get this amazing degree. Everyone will always finally, they'll finally know that, OK, this guy really is smart. He really is a high achiever. I will have proved it to everyone. I will have, you know, a credential that shows everyone that. But here's the thing, when I started doing banking, I knew I was not in the right place. I just, I knew it in my gut. In the same way that like when The Daily Show, that name jumped off the page at me and it was just something instinctual that like that overrode all these voices in my head telling me that I wasn't good enough. I had the same sort of reverse thing. I was in this situation and I had a voice that was just like, you know what, this is not you. And it's not about being good or bad at something. This is just not the right place for you. And here's the thing, I had chosen this path because it was like the safe thing to do. I had been like, okay, I had this dream. I'd love to be a comedy writer, but I'm gonna push that aside to do the safe path. But then sure enough, you know, doing that path a few years later, the world changed. I was no longer a shoe in to get some perfect MBA. Things started to change. This safe path that I had taken, turns out it wasn't that safe at all. And I was thinking, okay, well, if I did that, you know, just to do the safe path, and now it's not even working out. Why did, I, why did I let go of something that I was so passionate about? I also had a really serious health issue at that time. I had to have brain surgery and it just, everything kind of came into focus for me. And I started to listen to my instinct more and to think about who I am and what my values were and to think, okay, do I need to just stay on this path because I'm too scared to jump off of it? Or should I just listen to that sense of intuition that I've learned that has gotten me here so far that, you know, the Moorhead Kane Foundation really encouraged me to listen to and to follow. And then at a certain point, that fear of jumping off that path and having things not work, that seemed like nothing in comparison to the feeling of regret that I would have 30 years from now when I looked back and said, you know what, 
I knew all along, I really loved this thing. I had this, you know, unquenchable thirst to pursue this thing, but I was too scared to do it. And I decided that, you know what, I'm going to have to ignore those voices in my head right now and think, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, maybe it works out great. And, but if it doesn't, what, what happens? You know, I have a couple of years where I spent in New York doing comedy shows in the basement of no name theaters and meeting really fun people and having a great time. And that's a great story. That's, that's just part of the story. It works its way into the fabric of your life. And that's a great thing. It's not a failure. So that's when I reached out to someone named Dave Bernath, of course, Morehead Kane alum. And I told Dave my story and I thought I'm never gonna hear back from this guy. He emailed me back within 10 minutes and said, let's talk on the phone tomorrow. I talked to Dave and I told him my story about how he sort of works at, or I talked to him about how he works at the inter intersection of, of business and comedy and how I'd had this experience in comedy when I was in college and had this business experience right out of school. And I wanted to get back to something creative. And Dave helped me get in touch with the executive producer of a TV show on Comedy Central. I did an interview with her. She asked me what my background is. And I told this crazy story about how I worked in mergers and acquisitions and I really want to work in comedy now. And I thought, you know what, this is not going to sell her. She is not going to believe me at all. And she just kind of nodded and listened along. And at the very end, she goes, you know what, before I became a comedy writer, I spent three miserable years as a mergers and acquisitions attorney before I let go of that and decided to take the plunge. And the rest was kind of history from there. She hired me as a researcher. Even after that show ended, she became a assistant. And even after she left, I ended up getting promoted to writer. And it seems like that's the happy ending to the story. I got what I wanted and everything was good, but this self-doubt kind of skyrocketed from there once I started working in a creative profession, because the work I was doing is so intimate, it's so personal. And when you get rejected, and at least 75% of comedy writing is, is just facing constant rejection, um, you, feel, you start to question everything again, because it's like, I did it. And then, you know, I'm here, I'm doing it. And then it's like, well, I, I can write monologue jokes, but can I write sketch? I'm not sure I can, maybe I'm a one trick pony. And so that's something that I still grapple with to, to this day. But I knew that like, I couldn't be the only person who's still wrestling with that. But I have found some solutions that have really helped me work through it. And I know I'm probably over my time, but I cannot let go without giving you a few tips for how I deal with it. Uh, the first one is seek perspective from someone else. Someone talking to me today, or earlier this week, that a problem shared is a problem halved. And I think that's such a good phrase because just by unburdening yourself of telling somebody else, it's just out in the open and you're like, all right, it's not just sitting inside of me right now. You got to bear the burden of this because I told you. And sharing that with a close friend, just that alone is, is a big weight off. But on top of that, being vulnerable with somebody else is actually a really good thing because it, that's how you develop real relationships with people. So it's not only something that is good for you to help take your mind off this thing that's weighing you down. It's actually something that I think is you're planting the seeds for something great that you will benefit from later on down the road. Another thing that I, I really love, I've heard phrased different ways, but I, I like to say, check the facts. And that is look back on things in your life that are objective facts. You've got this voice in your head that is really warped. That's saying, you're really not very good. You may have done some good things in your life, but that's it, you've run out. But look at the things you've done. Think about the expertise that you've developed over the last however many years of your life. Look back on the things you've accomplished. You know, I know that everybody here has plenty of things that they should be proud of. And really talk to yourself the way you would talk or your most compassionate friend would talk to you or you would talk to a friend. Be as compassionate as you can. And, and acknowledge the things that you're thinking. Acknowledge that fear, but remember that just because you have those thoughts, it doesn't mean they're true. So really be compassionate with yourself and, and give yourself credit for trying, you know? Reward yourself for being good. Just making the attempt to be better, that is so valuable in and of itself. If you spend five minutes working towards a skill set or an ability that you feel insecure about, but you wanna get better at, that's your five minutes closer than you were at the beginning of the day. And the reality is that we spend so much time focusing on these titles that we have or these jobs that we have or degrees that we have really at the end of the day, it's about the skills. I mean, I, I wanted to be a comedy writer. I wanted my title to be comedy writer. And I found that having the job is not the joy. The joy is even those nights where I'm sitting up late on the couch, wrestling with something. It is, it is the process. The process is the joy. And it doesn't really matter whether you win an Emmy or you're on this show that's more important than another show or you have to make a certain amount of money. 
So really give yourself credit and encourage yourself for learning. And the last one is something I kind of mentioned earlier. It's, I, it works for me really well. As I ask myself when I'm really worried about something I say, and I really think I'm, I'm gonna screw something up, I think, okay, what is the worst thing that could happen? Let's look at the absolute worst case scenario. Kind of like when I thought, okay, if I walk away from a really lucrative career where I'm on this very stable path and people were like, there's gonna be a gap in your resume, it's gonna look weird. The worst possible scenario, maybe I find some other corporate job that's a lot like this one or better than this one, or I find something else. But you know, also, like I said, you have a bunch of good stories. Your life, it becomes a good story. And, and that's kind of, that is kind of the joy is that the ups and downs and the ugliness and the things that work and the things that don't. I mean, that's what makes the story interesting. Um, and I just want to leave you with a quote that I try to remind myself of every now and then. And that's if, if you're here right now, you have survived every single one of the days that you thought was the worst day of your life. And you've lived to tell the tale. So you can do it again. You just have to be a friend to yourself. Be compassionate to yourself and help lighten the load. Uh, I know I've gone over on time, so I'm sorry, Megan, but uh, thank you for indulging me and uh, thanks for listening. It was worth every second. Fabulous, Tom. Thank you so much. Uh, I know yeah. folks have questions. Um, like I said, if you want to ask a question of Tom, you can just unmute and, uh, and preferably have your video on and, and ask Tom a question. Uh, this is Jim Light. Hi, Jim. Um, I um, am, was the class of 1965, so um, um, uh, although I would say we still deal in retirement with the same issues you discussed, but my mm -hmm. wife and I mentored um, 11 uh, kids for, for five years. They had their first generation to go to college. They're now sophomores, and I keep thinking of how can we be helpful, and if I can get a recording of this, I'll send it to these 11 kids because they've got to be going through the same thing right now. <laughs> of course. I mean, Me Megan, this is being recorded, right? Yes, we'll be sharing the recording, Jim, and, and thanks for that. That's great. So Thank happy. You. That so was happy. terrific. That was terrific. That's Thank really you. good. Thank you so um, much. And thanks for tuning in. And thank you, Jim, for introducing yourself and giving your class year. I, I hope everybody will do that. You can say where you're calling from, things like that. It's great to put everyone in perspective. Jim, I assume you're in Colorado, yes? Yes, uh, we live uh, near Aspen, Colorado. Gotcha. But we have a large, um, you know, immigrant community here. Some of the, the parents have been here 20, 25 years and the kids, some dreamers, some citizens, but it's an integral part of our fabric. And, and they have no perspective at all about other immigrant communities. We try to describe waves of history and our history, but uh, the, your story in particular would be uh, helpful to them. That's amazing. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Tom, uh, we have a question from Mahir Shah. Uh, he says, thanks so much for your time. Tom, what were some of your strategies, if any, to continue writing while working in finance? Oh, that's a great question. I, um, I had to be really scrappy and kind of entrepreneurial about it because I didn't have much time. I also didn't have a ton of writing experience, so I was trying to get into it. Um, and one thing I can say, I mean, I, I mentioned Dave, um, you know, who Dave Bernath, who um, was a Moorhead Kane alum that I reached out to. And it's really, I think, one is just to, to write. I think writing anything is so useful. What I did specifically was I tried to utilize whatever skills I had at that time and find a way to work it into um, writing. So I reached out to actually a Moorhead Kane in my class, uh, my friend Libby. And I knew she was writing for a new site. Um, it was called Ozzy, O-Z-Y.com. And I said, Libby, I saw she'd written a couple articles. And I said, Libby, I'm really looking to write. I don't really know what I have to offer, but I will try anything. And I said, you know, right now I work in finance. So the only real skill set I have is when it comes to business and economic stuff. So if you need anything on that, let me know. So she reached out to Ozzy and um, they asked for some writing samples. I sent them some stuff and they said, we need somebody to talk about business and economics. Now, I definitely did not want to be a business nor economics writer. But, you know, you just have to do what you can, you know, it's like, I, that was what was right in front of me. So I started writing stuff about economics. I wrote about the economics of, of film and about Netflix and because that was new stuff, new stuff um, back then. Um, and so I just used whatever stuff 
I had. I talked a little bit about finance. I talked about um, these new like financial products that were being developed for water infrastructure. So I wrote for that for a little while. And then what I did was I wanted to write something more creative. So I used the samples from that, um, one of which got picked up by USA Today and NPR. I used those samples to go to this music blog that I really liked. And I said, hey, I really want to write about music. I've only written about business and economics, but here's some of my samples. And then I started writing for this music blog. So I was writing more creative stuff. And then when I wanted to write for comedy stuff, I said, listen, I haven't written a ton of comedy, but here's like some music stuff I've written. It's more creative. So whatever opportunity is right in front of you, it may not be, it may not seem like the goal that you're trying to get to, but use what you have and just start there and then leverage that into the next thing that's a little closer and you'll get closer and closer. And before you know it, you will have written a lot more than you ever thought. Your writing skills will have gotten so much better just by the sheer repetition and you'll just sort of inch your way closer and then, you know, you'll be within striking distance and before you know, you'll be doing it. Thanks, Tom. That's great. Ryan Jensen has a question for you as well. In getting into production writing, what is the balance between demonstrating skill and making industry connections? Well, I think the, the one thing that I do want to say is that like your skill set is something that no one can ever take away from you and that you don't need anybody else for. You know, uh, no matter what happens, you may not know anybody, um, you may not have the connections that you need, but if you're writing every day, if you're working on it, even if you don't know what you're doing, if you just keep writing, you will get better. You will learn from your own, you'll start to recognize your own mistakes more easily. So always, always be working on developing your skill set because that is something you have total control over. It's, it's the only thing you have total, total control over. So, so keep control it's very much relationship-based business. Um, so that is something that you do have to do. It's my least favorite part of this business is having to reach out because I sometimes feel awkward networking with people, but, but be genuine about it. Don't, don't feel like you have to make a connection, but that by making a connection, you're, you're just asking something of someone. Reach out to somebody and learn their story. And, and I think if you approach people with really pure intentions and you say, I want to learn about what you've done. I want to learn from you. And I want to see how I can be helpful to you. And it feels that it's like genuine and sincere. And it's not, um, you know, like you're trying to use somebody else just as a stepping stone. Um, I think you'll find that you have much more genuine connections. And it's the genuine connections that really will help you move. Because people in this industry love to work with their friends. Um, they love to hire their friends. So, you know, versus just kind of continually emailing, blasting out emails to everybody you know, focus on finding people you trust and you, you respect and you value and, and try to develop a genuine relationship with them because that'll, that'll take you far. Thank you. Uh, Jessica wants to know, how did you cope with failure? Still coping with it. Um, it is really tough. Um, I think especially, um, I, and I, I haven't always coped with it well, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, because even after I started um, as a researcher on a TV show, I felt like there was this, and then a writer's assistant, I felt like there was this huge hurdle to become an actual writer. And I felt like if I was a writer's assistant, I'm in the room, I'm pitching ideas, but I'm not like a writer, writer. My, my title isn't writer. And I kind of felt like if I don't have that title, then I'm, I'm nothing. I'm just, you know, somebody who just never quite got there. And I think it's a really, it's a really unhealthy and it's a really unhelpful way to look at things. And I, you know, I, looking back, I wish I did less of that. And I wish I thought of it more constructively because every failure is an opportunity to learn. And I know that's not that helpful to hear when you're feeling in the middle of it, but it's okay to acknowledge that you feel, you feel crappy about failing, you know, it, that's, that's normal. You know, successful people don't just avoid failure or they don't just blast through failure. They sit through it, they sit with the feelings. It does stink, but you let yourself feel that. And then you think, okay, I've let myself be upset about this and I'm letting myself be okay with the fact that I'm upset. Now let's sort of step back and see, okay, where did I mess up? How do I, because so much of just developing a skill set is just repetition. I, I wish I sort of knew that earlier that it's not about being naturally good at things. It's just about doing it over and over and over again. And it just gets exponentially easier. So, so try to remind yourself that a failure is, is a really good case study and how you can do it better the next time. So James has a question uh, from London. James asks, can you describe an average day working on the James Corden show? What have you learned during your time there? Yeah, I'll give you an average pre-quarantine day on the, on the show. That might make a little more sense. Um, so typically what we do is I, uh, I get up in the morning around eight or so. 
I'm kind of a sleepy guy. I can't, I'm not great at getting up early. Um, and then I will, I, I have like my New York Times morning briefing. I listen to NPR and then we go into work and we have a big meeting with all the writers around 9 a.m. And we'll talk through what kind of the big stories are of the day. We'll have our bagels. We'll just kind of interrupt each other and make jokes. And it's mostly non-productive, but it, it is also a good way to just kind of get the juices flowing for the day. Then from 9 to 11.30, the writer's assistant and our head writers will send out um, all the kind of big news stories of the day. 9 to 11.30, I sit at my desk and I just write nonstop. I write jokes nonstop. Usually we'll write on eight or nine stories. I'll write three or four jokes a piece. So, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 jokes or something like that. So the nice thing is that by lunchtime, I've sat and written for two hours because I've had no choice because that's my job. And so I've at least felt like, all right, I at least did that. Um, so I feel like I did something today. And then we will sort of cut down, we'll have a list of all the jokes that everybody and all the writers work on it. They write on their own stuff. And we just kind of contribute it into one document. We'll cut it down. We'll give that list of jokes to James Corden and our executive producers and our head writers. And we'll kind of check which jokes they like. And then um, I, along with um, two other writers, I, I mo work mostly on the monologue. That's kind of like my bread and butter, although everybody writes on everything. Um, the three of us will go into a room and we'll kind of physically piece the monologue together. Okay, let's do an introduction and then we'll introduce this story. What's a good way to introduce it? And we'll show these clips that we need and let's do this joke and then that joke. I know let's switch them. It makes more sense in that order. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, we'll do a rehearse. We'll bring a copy of that monologue to James for around 2.15. James will read through it with us, give us any notes he has, so, you know, like let's change these words. Let's cut that joke and swap something else in there. And then uh, we'll go back, rewrite that monologue, go to rehearsal around 2.30 or 3. Um, and then James will rehearse it live on the floor. And then we'll go up to the desk and we will get notes from James, the executive producers on the monologue and what we should change in between rehearsal and taping. Um, that'll be about 3.45. And then we'll go have 45 minutes to rewrite everything. If we want to change any of the clips, change any of the graphics, we deal with all that stuff. So we work with editors, we work with graphic artists. And then 4.45 or, you know, 4.30, we'll do another read through with James. And then at 4.45, we always line up in the hallway and it's kind of like this ritual. The last thing, James is fully dressed. He gets mic'd up, does one last read through of the monologue. And then we all walk into the studio. Um, James will record the monologue um, from the studio floor and we'll just kind of stand off to the side and just kind of hide from everybody. Um, and then if there's any notes, any things we need to change, um, we will take care of that stuff and then um, I'll usually spend, so that's around 5.30, and then spend uh, an hour or two just kind of working on my other assignments for the rest of the week. So we'll have, they'll say, okay, we got this actor coming on. They want to do something comedy-wise. Let's do a sketch. Um, so I'll pitch some sketch ideas, or it'll be like, we're going to do some desk bits. So let's just sort of group right on that in a Google Doc or something like that. So chip away at that and, um, you know, start it all over again the next day. Tom, if I could ask a question. Going off of um like your how's it going with your daily schedule uh pre-quarantine now during quarantine with production suspended you talked a lot about learning new skills and kind of being this uh, person who has a lot, a lot of interest in a lot of different areas so mm -hmm. kind of wondering what projects you're working on or things you're thinking about with i, I assume you have a little more time than, than normal yeah, in some ways I have more time. In some ways it's, it's, it's harder. So, I mean, we're all, I'm sure people know that. In some ways it's easier, in some ways it's harder. Mm -hmm. um, but I have been trying to stay productive. I've been working on a, um, writing an original pilot based on my time in banking. Um, so I've been working on that. Um, and I'm kind of, I, I did it, submitted it to some production companies and got some notes. So I'm doing a final rewrite of that right now. And it's nice to have something creative um, outside of my day job to focus on. And so that, that's been nice. And on top of that, um, I've always loved playing guitar. So I have the, um, we have like the band, the Corden band um, that plays on the floor, the guitarist in the band, I convinced him to give me some, uh, some guitar lessons. So he's been giving me some guitar practices uh, to, to work through. So I've been working on that and been um, trying to get better at cooking. So that's been kind of like, it's nice to have something that is just different from writing something that's tangential and I'm really bad at it, but I'm, I'm trying to get better. I have a question. Can you hear? I have a question. Yes, yes, Tom. Oh, you did a great job. First of all, awesome, Tom. This was oh, so thank good. You, Tom. 
That means so uh, much coming from you. Oh man, I tell you what, yeah, I was just awesome. But let me ask you this, how did you get so good at the head game of all this? You know, the inside game. It sounds like you, you're so good at, you know, let's do the worst case scenario and let's frame the worst thing that could happen. And hey, I'm gonna get a good story at least out of that. And that's just, I've seen in so many people's lives who can't do that, they're stuck. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, I mean, I was really lucky. Early on, my dad told me life is supposed to be a series of adventures. The one you're on now is preparing you for the next one in ways you probably can't even imagine. And if you really buy that, you know, it gives you a sense of hope and a sense of confidence in, in the future. Where did you get this? I mean, did you, did you learn this from other people or is this just a natural gift that you know how to play the head game? Because it's, it's rare and it's so important. Thanks, Tom. I, I really appreciate that. It's, it's definitely something I had to work on. So if you're in this chat and you feel like, okay, I don't really have that. I promise you there's hope because I, I'm, I wasn't always like that. And I, I do think, especially like I said, I was, I was working a little bit against, you know, I love my parents. I'm so close to them. I feel bad. Like, I feel like I'm bad mouthing them, but you know, I was raised, we just, they grew up in sort of a different environment and we grew up with these kind of like conservative, I don't mean politically conservative, but conservative in terms of taking risk, um, that approach. And I think, you know, part of it, part of it is my nature. I was always, I got bored easily and I wanted to try something that was different. I was really independent and I wanted to explore, um, you know, maybe part of it comes from the fact that both of my parents worked a lot when I was young. And so I spent a lot of time going to camps and, and, you know, day camps, things like that, where I was just expected to just kind of thrown in with a bunch of other kids. Um, usually, you know, you uh, you know, up in, background, up in, a, in a largely white area and it was just like every day felt like an adventure in, in those environments and I kind of learned okay if you can't have fun with it and if you don't feel like this is an adventure that you're on you kind of fall apart you know you got to like find a way to I don't know if gamify is the right word but but yeah. see what you're doing as an adventure and and then it becomes a lot more fun and you get to have fun with it instead of feeling like it's a series of these obstacles that you have to like get over, otherwise you fail. It's like, see it more like it's just this kind of like, this trail you gotta, you gotta blaze or this, this trail you have to go down and, and like have fun along the way. You know, that, that's what's so important to me that you, you've said some very liberating things this evening. Like the fact that, uh, you know, if you don't feel like you're a natural to the process and, and, and people who are farther along than you always look like naturals, right? Like yeah. that free throw shooter and you forget it's his 3,500,000th free throw, right? That's why he looks exactly. natural. But the whole thing about the joy of the process is this super liberating thing. I've been reading Epictetus and Seneca and Marcus Aurelius uh, again this week. And Epictetus had, that, well, all the Stoic philosophers had so much to say about that. And uh, the right process can put you into the state of joy that you never expected to experience since you think of yourself as taking risks, right? A risk is, is not supposed to be a joyful thing. But if you do it right, uh, you experience exactly what you, you've experienced. So, man, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of good in passing on this message. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Tom. I mean, it, it, it is really true. It's, I think, like I said, it's like, even, even when I started out doing this stuff, it was like, I, I felt like I was working towards something. And it was really this idea of getting this position or this title or this job. And it turns out that that the day that I got the job was not at all the happiest day that I've had doing this. It's yeah. the days where you're like in the trenches um, with somebody else and you're just having a blast doing it. Or you're just banging your head against a wall for hours when you think there's just no way to fix something. And then when you find that way that, to fix it and you've come up with it yourself and it's because you've spent all these hours and hours and hours practicing it feels like you know it feels like flying it's it's yeah. so fun yeah definitely that's great tom um karina has a question for you as well she says thank you so much for speaking with us you mentioned several factors that led you to comedy writing i was wondering if there was a specific poignant moment that spurred you to take the leap i i think you know, there, there's so much like in my childhood, you know, watching stuff like from, I loved Conan O'Brien, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, um, Saturday Night Live. I loved all that stuff. But I think like the one moment for me that was like when I switched over um, to, for, to making that leap was I think it was like the first night I, I took an improv class. 
Um, I was working in private equity at the time and I was still really struggling with, um, still really struggling with what to do. Um, you know, should I go to graduate school? Is, is that the reset I need? I knew I needed some kind of reset. And I kind of like put the, the comedy thing behind me. It just sort of felt like, oh, that was a fun hobby when I was young. And, and that's, that's kind of it. But I decided, you know, I just, I need to do something. I got to get my mind off to this work stuff. And I took an improv comedy class and I had so much fun. It was a three hour class and it flew by in what felt like 15 minutes. And it was so much fun. And it like, it lit up something so visceral and so pure in me that in the same way that like I talk about how when I looked at that sheet of all these internships or all these jobs, more had Canelons have and that daily show jumped off at me. It was like, it was something so pure that it was like, it lit this fire and I was like, oh my God, I was like, yes. I was like, that is the thing that I love so much. That's why I took that internship. That's why I thought about all this, spent all this time in college thinking about how much I wanted to do that. And that, that was the day I decided, literally after that first class on the way home, I thought, okay, as soon as this last, I finished the last day of my contract, I was working in Boston at the time. I was like, I'm packing up my things and I'm moving to New York City no matter what. That, I, I knew it that day. That's great. So we um, go from a current scholar to James Barnes, class of 77. Uh, his, his question is, he says, thanks for speaking. What is your favorite comedy sketch of all time? Oh, that's funny. Um, I really love, there's, there's a Saturday Night Live sketch that Tina Fey wrote um, with Christopher Walken, um, where there's a, uh, Tim Meadows is like trying to get a, uh, he's a census taker and, he's, and he goes to this apartment and he's trying to to get answers from Christopher Walken. It's really absurd. I, I would do a horrible job if I tried to explain it, but if you look up census Christopher Walken on Saturday Night Live, he's trying to ask Christopher Walken these very mundane questions and he keeps giving the most absurd answers and he's so, he's so detached from reality. It's really absurd, it's really surreal and it's both really dumb and really smart. And I, for me, like that's, that's the sweet spot of comedy when you have something that's it's really smart and really dumb and that, that really does it for me. That's awesome. Uh, your old buddy, Namal Huck, asks, I have a two-part question. How did you handle the conversations with your parents about your choice to pursue a risky career? And has your success improved your marriage prospects? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, thank you so much for those questions, Namal. Um, it was, it took some time to win my parents over. Like, we actually had some pretty hard conversations while I was in college because when I tried to tell my parents that I was really interested in, in writing comedy, I think um, they, to me, comedy writers were heroes to me because they were all, the best comedy writers were really, really smart people who found ways to take dumb things and make them smart. Um, and they didn't take themselves too seriously. And I, and I really loved that. And I don't think, I think my parents thought it was more like I was trying to do like a vaudeville act. I, I don't think there was like a little bit of talking past each other there. And so they were worried, like my, my, I remember my dad saying he was worried that I was losing focus when in reality, I was like, no, things are coming into focus. Um, and they were worried. And I, I know it was only, they worried for me out of, um, out of love and out of concern and wanting me to have a bright future. Um, but we really had a turning point as a family. Um, I didn't elaborate on too much, but when I was, when I was working in banking, I was working really, really crazy hours and it was really stressful. Um, so much so that like I ended up having a, a blood vessel burst and I had to have surgery. And I think that moment really kind of crystallized things for me, but also for my parents. And they saw how unhappy I was. And they were like, this doesn't seem like the regular joyful you that we know. And at this point, like, you know, I think, you know, situations like that really, really put things into perspective. And I, and I think for them, they really opened up. I, I wasn't even asking them. And they were saying, you know what, like, we want you to do whatever you want. We're going to love you no matter what happens. And your career path doesn't have anything to do with how much we love you. So you do what you want and what's going to make you happy. You've done this stuff because you've worried about us being unhappy. You've paid your dues. Go for it and we will support you. Um, I think I think when I got my first um, TV job, my parents were really excited. My dad was like, this is great. And you can do this for a year and then you can still apply to business school. And I was like, no, d dad, that's over. I'm not, not doing that anymore. Um, but when they saw how happy I was, and then, I, I mean, of course, um, you know, once things really started to take off, I mean, now they, they couldn't be prouder. And so I'm really grateful. They're, they're wonderful. Uh, have they improved my marriage prospects? I mean, that's to be seen. 
<laughs> keep us posted on that, please. Okay. Um, Noam Argoff, who is a filmmaker, and so her question will not surprise you. She says, hi there, thanks, thanks for taking the time. Have you ever thought of writing a film, a feature film, or is TV your preferred medium? Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, it's something that I would definitely be open to doing down the road. It's definitely something of interest. I think for me right now, kind of like what I was saying earlier, when you have something right in front of you, it's nice to sort of be like, okay, this is what I'm doing. What's the next thing? So for me right now, um, I've really been working on developing the skill set of writing scripted TV. Um, so I've been working late night for a long, not a long time, but for the majority of, uh, the time I've been working in television and, and that's been great and I feel like I've developed a really strong skill set there and I'm working on developing the skill set for scripted TV but I think film could be the next thing after that perhaps. We'll see. So I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions before we wrap up if anybody wants to jump in um, by unmuting. Hi Tom. My name is hey, Prina. I'm in the class of 2022. Um, so I was wondering once you made the switch from um, private equity to comedy writing and you felt that process that you talked about was too slow or you wish it was progressing faster, like how you kept yourself motivated during the transition between the two? Thanks. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, part of it was, it was helpful that um, even on the worst days, I was like, there's a 0% chance I'm going back to banking. So that I knew I was like, okay, no matter how bad this gets, I still feel like I made the right choice. It is really tough though. And I, I was lucky. I, I really relied a lot on friends because I had other friends. I met really, really wonderful people um, who were in the trenches with me and kind of in those low level positions. And we all kind of wondered, is it ever going to happen for us? You know, did we make a really stupid choice right now or what? And it's really nice. I think no matter what you're going through, like community is so important and you know you don't need a big community but you just need a few people that you really trust and you know who are really empathetic and are willing to listen to you so for me on the days where i really felt like i don't know if this is going to happen i talked to my other friends and and we, we were able to share our concerns and our insecurities and just by putting them out in the open it kind of felt like okay we're distributing this burden amongst a few of us. So I'm not the only one. I think just, I mean, sometimes just knowing that you, you know, those moments can feel so isolating when you're just like, I'm, I've created this big mess for myself and it's all me and I did all this and it's just me and no one else knows it. It's like just finding someone else who feels the same way as you, even if it's not the exact same situation. It's just like knowing that you're not alone. It's just, it makes a world of difference and you can kind of unburden yourself a little bit. One more from the audience, anybody? All right. Don't be shy. Yeah. Well, Tom, thanks again. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, you know everybody for, for joining in. Um, I'm so grateful for it. And, and like I said, it, it is, it's really a gift to be able to connect with other people right now, especially other people in the Morehead King community done so much for me, it, it's, it's nice to feel like, um, you know, with family. Yes, thank you again, Tom. A great opportunity for all of us to spend some time together, learn a few things, grow a little bit, and it was fantastic. So thanks so much. Thank you.